going to be doing is we're going to be going through a tooltip, building uh, an inline tooltip widget so that we can actually custom style the default Chrome tooltip and so it actually stays up there long enough for you to read anything that is in place. So the way we're starting out is we've got our anchor tag with a title of what we're looking at and a link to where we want to go whenever someone actually clicks NFLX. NFLX doesn't actually mean a whole lot, so we put a title on it so that people and screen readers can actually tell that that's the Netflix stock quote. So, going into the next one, whenever we start applying an inline, the code that we're wanting to do is going to look like this. So that we mouse over it, we get a nice, pretty Chrome build that we can custom style to match whatever UI that we're, that we're building or implementing the system in. And just to give a little walkthrough of how all of this is going down, we've got our link tag, which is pulling in our tooltip.css style sheet. And that's what gives our drop shadow using CSS3 drop shadows and gradients. And then we have our simple YUI, which is fantastic because it pulls everything that we want to pull in into it with one call. We have our same anchor tag that we had before. And then we start with walking through capturing the anchor tag with y.1, assigning that to an LNK variable. We have our tooltip text, which is what's going to be placed into the tooltip. And that is LNK dot get attribute, which is extended from DOM inside of Node. So we, act, we just get attribute and then which attribute we want. If we wanted to get the href, we could get the href just by changing this to href. And then the tooltip node itself, we're actually going to create the tooltip node on the fly. So we don't have extra markup inside of our HTML page that we don't need in the event that anybody can't run JavaScript. So the first thing we do is we get rid of the attribute that is on top of it, or that's actually attached to the link. The reason why we do this so if we comment this out and we refresh, we'll actually get two tooltips. And that is definitely not what we want to do. So we have to remove the title tag just by setting the, or the title attribute by setting the attribute value to an empty string. Next, we go in and set the text on the tooltip node to the tooltip text that we gathered earlier from the attribute. So at this point in time, our div that we are creating actually has the tooltip text inside, inside of it. Then we append the tooltip to the DOM just by telling it to insert after. And what this does is this will replace the tooltip node after the anchor tag inside of the actual HTML document. Uh, there are a couple of different methods. You can insert before, insert after. You can uh, you can prepend with it. Uh, insert's really really great, and there's a lot of sugar that's built into Node that makes the interface a little bit easier if you're wanting to append and and prepend. And then we attach our event listeners. We're actually uh, let me get rid of this. The comment doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, we, we attach our event listeners. We could we doing this all in one step. You can do this line uh, event by event just by doing something like lnk dot on mouse over and then function. If you spell function properly. You could do it that way, and then you would have to write your mouse out event Sep separately. But what we're going to do is we're doing this all in one step by passing an object and then having a key value pair where the key is the event 
and the value is the function that we're going to actually fire whenever that event takes place. So the one thing that we want to do is whenever we mouse over, we want to make sure that, that to the tooltip gets displayed. And then we want to set it to the coordinates of the mouse. But we don't want it right underneath the tip of the mouse. We want it to actually be offset down and to the right a little bit. So we're, we're going to get the e.pageX, which is the mouse position on the page. And page X and page Y, and that's passed through the event that mouse over, it passes the event coordinates to it. Mouse out's the same way. The only thing that we're going to do at, on this one, just to keep it easy, is we're going to hide it. We're not going to worry about changing positions or anything like that, setting it off the page. Uh, we're just going to display none, and that way whenever we mouse out, it goes away. If we mouse over up here and we start chasing it, it keeps going until it goes away. Then for the the next step, we're actually going to turn this into a plugin. The process, I mean the end result looks exactly the same as it did before because the code is virtually the same. But we'll be walking through exactly how the plugin is created. And just a quick overview of how to create a plugin. Uh, this is my method that I use, uh, something that has taken place inside of about a year of hanging out in the IRC channel. And what we do is we actually ex use base create to create a plugin. What it takes, it takes in the name of the module that you're going to be doing, what you're extending, which in our case we're going to be extending y.plugin base. If you want to mix anything in, like for instance, if it was a widget or if you were, if you had some abstract class that you're wanting to mix into your plugin, you could take advantage of that. Your prototype is the fourth parameter, and this is going to be any methods. Now, the initializer and the destructor, you don't have to have those in there. The initializer fires whenever the plugin is actually plugged into whatever it is that you're plugging in. And the destructor is fired whenever you unplug whatever it is that you're unplugging. The namespace is very, very important. I'll show you why in just a moment. But the namespace gives you the ability to actually talk to your plugin on the module or the node or the widget or whatever it is that you're plugging into. If you don't have a namespace in here, if you did this, it actually will silently fail and you'll be scratching your head for hours. Um, trust me on that one. And then our ATTRS is where we pass in any getter and setter attributes that we want to apply to it later on. The version isn't actually being used right now, as far as I know, on add, but it's planning on being used later on at some point. And then our requires is our metadata for what our plugin actually requires. Because I'm using base.create, it requires that we have base build. And because we're extending, plugin base, then it's required that we have plugin. And that's the mechanics of it. So what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be writing the, the same plugin logic in line. We have our y.add because we're uh, attaching it to the simple YUI instance instead of the yui.add that I just showed. Uh, and then we have our gallery tooltip because it may eventually make it into the gallery. I don't feel like renaming it later on. The uh, y.tooltip is what the object is that's actually going to be call called. It's uh, getting assigned to the tooltip namespace inside of the y object. And then we do the base create. We give it our name of tooltip. We extend base, not mixing anything in. And then we get started on our prototype. Um, because the static is a little bit easier to follow. Uh, I'll jump down to this real quick. The uh, namespace is tooltip. Uh, I just I typically keep all my plugins the same namespace as I do my actual plugin name. Uh, it's just easier to follow that way. Unless it's a really long name, I may shorten it up so that it's easier to, to actually implement. 
that our content is where we're going to be storing the tooltip text in. And we don't, we're not going to initialize anything. Um, it may be a string. It may be a function. The, I don't know if you guys saw the uh, life ray best standards, but it's very possible that you may want to do this. If you want to make sure that it's always a string. Um, compression sake, you may want to you know, namespace that out, but for the demonstration purposes, I just have it in there so that it's available whenever we want to set it and get it. The template that we use is the exact same file or exact same template that we created earlier uh, from the inline version. Whenever we created the node, I have the template available inside the ATTRS. That way you can pass it into the config whenever you generate it. You can set it later on if you want to update it. And really you can just make the tooltip whatever, whatever kind of DOM text that you want. Back up into the initializer. Um, one practice that I follow in most of everything that I write is the very first line of any method, I put the method name, write it out as info, and then the class or the object that's actually firing that event. That way whenever I'm trying to debug and find out when something doesn't fire properly, I can always step through and know exactly what step it got to last or what step it, it follows. And to plug in does not have a render UI or bind UI method attached to it natively like the widget does. So I create my own render UI and bind UI methods. Uh, this right here is something that if you look at any of my widgets on, in the gallery, that's something that you would see most often. Yes? Yeah, right. Whenever you use the build tool, it creates the min file, the debug, and the raw. And the min tool gets everything compressed, and it takes out all the y.log and console.log. Um, Luke, does it actually take console.log out? Do you know? No. No, just y.log. It, it removes. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in IE, whenever you've got the uh, developer tools hidden. Yeah, that's not good. Um, but so whenever we do render UI, what we're going to do is we're going to call this.gethost. In plugin, this.gethost is whatever you're plugging it into. It's the host of the plugin. In our old code, what we were doing, or in the inline version, we were doing link.setAttribute title to nothing. In this one, we're calling link because we're going to be plugged into it. And as this I get host, and the exact same code follows after that. Set attribute title to nothing. That way we don't get the two tooltips showing up. With the we create our uh, protected attribute for tooltip node. Nothing that anybody ever really needs to access outside of it, but it's there in case anyone does need to interact with it for any reason. This dot tooltip node is equal to y dot node create from the and then we're going to get it from the template. This line of code is almost exactly the same as this line of code. Um, we're creating a tooltip node. We're creating a y dot node and assigning it to that variable. And then we set the, the text con to the content that is in the ATTRS. There again, it mimics the exact same code that we had before. Set attribute, or set text, and then the tooltip text that we collected earlier. And then we insert after the host. There again, the exact same code. I mean, it's very similar to what you would write in line very easy to uh, take your inline code and make it into a plugin if you're attaching it to a plug to something that's going to be a plugin so this dot get host insert after and then our tooltip node that we just created and then after render UI fires 
up here. Once it gets done with that, we do bind.ui or bind UI. And what that does is that says this.gethost. And then we're going to bind the events for mouse over and mouse out to internal events that we've got going on. So we've got show tooltip and hide tooltip. There again, uh, the best practices that were talked about earlier. Uh, this is a method for that before we were doing inline functions. But now we're having those functions extended out into separate functions. So if you were, if the tooltip was extended or uh, used in other applications and you want, wanted to overwrite how show tooltip is defined, this would be the way to do it. You can extend it and then augment how show tooltip actually functions. All we're doing with this is we're setting display to block. We're getting our mouse event passed to it so that we have page X and page Y. We're offsetting by five still so that it goes down to the, and to the right a little bit. And then for hide tooltip, we're doing the exact same thing. This tooltip node display none. So that's taking it. It's a bit more verbose than the inline code, but it makes it extremely reusable. So to follow suit, after your plugin's created, the only thing you have to do at that point is target the node that you're wanting to plug, use the plugin that we just created, and then plug it in to the link node. What we're doing on the second part of this, this is the class name or the object that you're wanting to plug in, and it has to be defined as a plug as a plugin. It also has to have that NS tooltip, uh, just to show you what happens whenever we take this out. If we hit refresh, we get the same ugly tooltip that the Chrome gives us in our browser. And there are no error messages. And there again, you, that's one of those things that you'll scratch your head about. So if you ever create a plugin, you can't get it to plug in, always check to see if the namespace is actually assigned to it. The second part of the plug is our configuration that we're passing to it. And in this case, we're setting the content to the get attribute of the title. It's the same method that we used previously to get the attribute out of the title and set it to the tooltip text. We're just doing it all in one line and passing it to the content. And there we refresh that. We get the tooltip showing up, except now it's a plugin. Another another idea that there is is we have the ability to plug and unplug our plugin. With and this would be one of the instances of where you wanted to use a plugin over a widget. Um, plugins generally add functionality on the fly, and you can remove functionality on the fly by unplugging it. So if we start off, we get the standard Chrome. If we click, it will actually take us to another page. If we go back and we plug it in, we get our new tooltip. If we click, we're actually doing a prevent, and I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. And then we can unplug it again. We get our standard Chrome, and then the link works again. So to go into the code a little bit to find out exactly how that works, I'm just going to, it's the exact same plugin that we used before. Uh, there's a few extra things that I've added to it. Uh, we have our, we have you taken our mouse events and added them to protected variables inside of the plugin. And what this does is this going to, is going to give us the ability to remove those later on so that the, we're not trying to fire something that no longer exists once we unplug it. The same render and bind as earlier. And on the destructor, as I said earlier, whenever I was talking about how the plugin is, is uh, structured, the destructor is fired once the plugin is told to unplug itself. So it's up to the author to decide how everything's going to take place once the plugin is unplugged. What we do is we take our content that we removed earlier whenever we said, uh, set the attribute for title on the host to nothing. We need to add that back in there so that it actually works like it did before we messed with the node at all. 
The other thing we need to do is we need to detach the mouse over and the mouse bind events. That way, there again, it doesn't try to fire mouse events on something that doesn't exist anymore. To prevent the click, we use this. What this does is uh, whenever the host event fires a click method, or the, the fires the click event, we're going to capture that uh, because we're going to capture it before it actually fires. The on, the, in the event structure, you have on, and then the event itself, and then after. So you can listen to things either before to prevent it or listen to it after the changes takes place. So what we'll do is we prevent the default, which the default value of an anchor tag is to relocate the, the browser generally. And then the alert was just something so that we knew that if the whenever you clicked, we actually were preventing that event. We take our our mouse event or our events that are binded to the host out just a little bit and we're using them separately so that we can detach the events individually whenever we unplug. And then everything else is exactly the same. Show tooltip and the hide tooltip. If we want to go a little bit crazier with it, maybe we wanted to maybe animate the plugin whenever it shows up, whenever you mouse over, mouse out, you get a nice little fade with it. The way this works is all we do is we update the show tooltip and the hide tooltip. And using the transition, which makes it makes think life a lot easier now than having to go through the whole animation pro build process, we set the opacity to zero so that it starts out at zero and then we call transition to fade it in. Uh, if we wanted to start out at 0.5 so that there was something there while it was fading in, we could do that. The, and then the high tooltip, we start out or we set the transition to zero. The second argument for the transition method is the callback function. So once this animation is done, what do we want to do? We, wanna, we actually want to display, set display to none so that it hides. Um, just to give you a contrast of, let's see, I don't know. There you go. give you a contrast of how how the two are different from each other. We take we take our original show tooltip, and we do transition to the end of it. Uh, for the hide tooltip, we take our set display none, and we just call that after the animation has been complete. So it's not a whole lot of code or extra code that you have to write in there to make it fade in and fade out, which is really, really nice. The next step is actually making it external because what we want to do is now that we have all of this code in here, our page is about 85 lines of code for just one very simple tooltip that's being attached to it. And it just adds a lot of markup. It's very hard if you have back-end designer or back-end developers and then front-end developers that don't really know anything about JavaScript, they just know HTML and CSS. We definitely don't want them to see our JavaScript code and muck things up because it's very possible that they will. So what we do is we take our HTML and now we're going to use YUIMin so that we can actually attach modules to the YUI instance instead of using simple YUI. So the, the architecture gets a little bit more verbose, but that's only because we're hosting this locally. If we were actually pulling it from the gallery, we would be able to just use this portion and it would go and grab it from the gallery and we could still use simple YUI. So we, whenever we are defining our modules, we give it our name, and this name needs to match the name that we used earlier whenever we did our, our add. So this name needs to match that. The full path can be a, an HTTP, HTTPS if you wanted to. It could be um, absolute or relative. And then we also need to put in what it requires here. 
Uh, the metadata doesn't actually translate over whenever we use this method. So we need to add it here so that we can make sure that all the uh, required dependencies are added in at runtime. And then, so after this takes place, we'll grab our, our link again, and then we plug it in. That's a little bit difficult to read there. I thought there was... Uh, there we go. The white space was killing me. It was making me think of, there was an error somewhere. But with, the, with this, the, the link, everything is the same, except we have taken our tooltip and added it to an external file. External file is the exact same code that we looked at before. The only thing is now the, the difference is, is that we have yui.add since that's the global object that we're attaching to versus y that simple yui was, was giving us. Um, the inside content is exactly the same. So from this point, I'm going to save that so I don't have it. So from this point, we're actually loading in two separate files to get this to, to come up, but the functionality is exactly the same. And what this does, this gives you the ability that if you had multiple pages, you're not copying and pasting your JavaScript from page to page to page to get your plugin to work. It also makes, gives you the ability to host this up on the gallery so that you don't actually have to serve the file yourself. You can pull it down from Yahoo CDN. Um, and this right here is actually a plugin that can be served up and distributed out for anyone to use that wanted to use a tooltip. The next thing is we're going to make a widget. You'll be uh, intrigued to know that the functionality is exactly the same as it was before. But with the widget, what we're going to do is instead of plugging it in, we are going to render it onto the screen. We're going to bind our mouse events to it, and then we'll be creating it. So let's look at how the widget is actually constructed first. Widget's a little bit more verbose than the plugin architecture is. It's got some stuff built into it. Uh, this is what you will generally use. Yes? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the, my general rule of thumb is that with a plugin, if I'm adding functionality to something that exists that I may or may not want all the time, then I'll go with a plugin. Um, for instance, like with the, with the tooltip, if, if I go with a plugin, I have the ability to plug it in and plug it out. And um, with the simple data table that's inside of the gallery right now, it has a lot of plugins that are associated with it. There is a, a, a sort and a resize, and you may not always want it to be sortable. Maybe there's certain events that fire that you want to plug, plug in a sortable plugin so that you can resort and then unplug it later on. So that's what I would do. It also makes it, uh, plugins make it easier for you to mix things up a bit instead of having all the functionality associated with one widget. Maybe you have other developers or other authors or other implementations that are going to be using it that don't need all of that extra code that could be abstracted out into a plugin. Whereas with a, with a widget, um, Generally, a widget, I would say anything that's going to be uh, static in the DOM most all the time, uh, that's whenever I would go with a widget. So uh, with, the, uh, with the way that this works is that the y, yui.add is exactly the same that we did earlier, except this time we've got widget name instead of plugin name. We also have our widget that we're creating using base create as we were earlier, our name, what we're extending, what we're mixing in, which is nothing. Generally, if you're doing a widget and you're wanting to use build something like overlay with a standard mod, then you would mix in standard mod here. Um, then we've got our prototype, which is all of our methods. And then we have our ATTRs. Uh, notice we don't need a namespace. Uh, the plug, the, na the NS ATTRs is only for the plugin. It's uh, that's the only place it's actually used. We have our initializer and our destructor. There again, whenever uh, instead of widgets being unplugged, 
they you can call the destroy method and it will call the destructor. It's always up to the author to decide how the destroy method is or how the widget's going to be destroyed. There is a render that you don't you don't actually need to write render or renderer. I just wanted to pull these in to show you uh, what's happening on the inside. Whenever you fire, whenever you call render to make the widget render, it fires the render event. The default method of that is to fire renderer, and you you guys can look at the sources up on the YUI docs if you want to. Uh, it fires renderer, and renderer fi fires in sequence render UI, bind UI, and sync UI. Uh, I, that's the method that I really liked a lot uh, and the method names that I liked a lot, so I always pull those into any plugin that I create. And then we have render UI, bind UI, and sync UI. Uh, the difference between these three, render UI uh, is anything that you're going to be manipulating on the DOM, class name changes, uh, actually building nodes, you would want to put inside of render UI. There again, uh, the best practices was talking about creating other methods that you call internally so that it can be extended. Uh, if you wanted to create a button on your render and maybe it was a button one in one, impl uh, one implementation and maybe another instance you wanted to have it as an anchor tag, that would be where you would, you would overwrite that button create method. With bind, you would take that button and bind any events to it. You would bind any events to uh, we'll see in just a moment uh, some events that we're binding into the tooltip. And then sync UI. Sync UI is the only one of the three that I would say that you would ever call more than once. Um, this, is, this is the method that you would take to sync up any changes that maybe happen outside of the widget that you would want to make sure affect inside of the widget. Like with the slider, if you have the slider widget that's uh, changing the value content of an input box and maybe the the user changes the value content of that input box themselves and you want to register a blur event to sync up and move the slider by itself, this is where that would happen. And then anything else that you do outside of that, it all, it all goes in the prototype unless it's absolutely private and then it would go up here. Um, let's see. So the way that we use it, actual widget tooltip that we create, we, there again, we didn't need our initializer because it automatically builds everything from the config. We're not, dis, we're not manipulating any of the data that gets passed through. So our render UI, let's uh, look at the tooltip real quick too. That way you can see how, the, how these are different. This is our render UI from our tooltip earlier and uh, from the plugin. And this is the render UI from the widget. What we're doing is we're going to get the content box of the widget, and we're going to set the content, whatever the content is that we pass to the, wid to the actual tooltip widget in the ATTRs. The content box, there, it's, it's like the widgets are developed with a double div uh, markup, where you have your bounding box, which is outside, and then your content box is inside. And all of your widget content gets loaded and should get loaded into your content box. This um, creates abilities for styling, for padding, um, so that you can actually do extra cool things as far as CSS is concerned outside of it without having to create extra uh, DOM models inside. I um, believe the, the YUI team decided that it was probably more frequent that widgets were being created with two wrapper divs on the content versus just one and they it makes a, it makes a lot of sense um, they have the ability let's uh, open up something real quick one thing that you can do if you don't want to div you can do a bounding template say if I wanted a button as my bounding template. So then I would have a button outside and I would have, if I was creating a button widget, this is how I would take care of that with having a button in my bounding box and a span as my content box. Then anything that I add to that button 
would all go inside of that span on the inside. Discard. So that's that's where the render comes in because we're actually manipulating the DOM on that one. For the animations that we do, we're not finding any events inside, and and we're not really syncing any UI up because the tooltip is going to be showing up for just brief instances. So the tooltip itself, it has the same animation that we did before, except now this time we're not, we don't have an underscore in front of it because we want to let everyone know that that is a public method that you can call. And the same thing with the hide tooltip. We've got the exact same animation code from one into the other. We're also not using a template this time because everything's being handled with the way the widgets are being created. So in here, whenever we pass, whenever we create a new, new tooltip widget, we're actually going to go ahead and pass the content in from the attributes, just like we did whenever we created or attached the plugin, except now it has its own variable and its own, own existence inside of the page. And then for the link, we're going to remove the attributes. Set attribute will return link, so it's chainable. So at this point in time, it's just like doing L and K on. It's just sometimes it's easier to write that way, less, less code. We attach our mouse over events. What we do is, in this, this instance, we're going to be using y.bind. And what this does is that we're going to say, call this function tooltip, but make sure that this, the context of the widget itself, is assigned to the tooltip. Otherwise, it's going to be assigned to the mouse event. And that's one of those points where you would get really confused whenever, you're, whenever you see something that says, this.showTooltip doesn't exist anymore because it doesn't because it's assigned to the mouse event, not to the tooltip. So mouse out, we bind hide tooltip to the tooltip method or to the tooltip object. And then we call render. And what render does, as we saw earlier, render is actually going to set the content of the tooltip to the content and it's going to append it to the body. If you wanted to, if you for one reason or another, if you had a div for you always wanted your tooltip to go inside of here for one reason or the other. Um, this happens a lot with certain widgets that you want to be placed inside of one place, but you don't want it to be uh, appended directly to the body. With tooltip, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but maybe you have a data table or a slider or something else, maybe an accordion, you can tell it to render into a specific ID. Like that. And then just to take it a bit further, we have one tooltip that's being attached to one link and it's really not that not that useful if you had multiple ones. You would have to create a widget for every single one, and we'd have to set the content individually for it. So I was uh, I was playing around earlier and decided to make go ahead and make one that worked on multiple links. So we have a tooltip for that, and we bring it over there. Um, we let's see. this to show up, maybe. You see we have our tooltip widget displayed right there. We've got our two divs, our bounding box and our content box. And Netflix stock quote is in there right now because that was the last one that I moused over. Let's see. It's got Yahoo in it. And then if we mouse over that, it's not updating the resources. 
you can see it. In, you can see it in Firebug. It will actually change the value inside of that. If we uh, yeah, but it's actually changing it instead of creating multiple widgets on the page. I'll show you the architecture of how we did that. It's a little bit different. Whereas we create one tooltip, we're not actually going to pass a uh, content value to it in the beginning. We're going to loop through with y.all to get a node list of all of the anchor tags on the page, which I don't, I don't know if you guys saw that earlier, but we've got two of them up here now instead of just the one. So we're going to loop through each one. We're going to do something uh, called set data. And what this is going to do, this is going to give us the ability to assign data to that node instance and that we can ret retrieve later on. Uh, because what we want to do is we want to get rid of that attribute, that title attribute, because we don't want the two tooltips to show up like we like we showed earlier. So with, with node.getAttributeTitle being assigned to the data key value of title, we can retrieve that at any time. Then we remove the attribute, and then we assign our mouse events to it. The same way we did from the inline version, we assign the mouse events to it with on, and then we have mouse over, and that is going to call tooltip.set content, and then we're going to get the data out of it that we assigned earlier, and then we're going to do show to tooltip and pass the mouse event to it. That way it can pick up the page X and page Y. Uh, the one reason why we don't do the we we don't do something like uh, one reason why we don't do that is because. Later on, whenever you switch back to it, it's going to try to pull back in that tooltip text, which is not going to exist anymore. So assigning it to the, the node in the data makes it retrievable very easily. You mean when you do a hover, a mouse over one, and then you go back to Right. One? Right, because it, it's going to go back and try to pull that variable back in, uh, which would be an empty string at that point in time. So your tooltip would be empty. And then for the mouse out, we do the same thing that we did before. We hide the tooltip by binding it to the tooltip. And then we call render. The architect difference inside of the tooltip widget itself is a bit different as well. What we do is we do after content change. The reason why we do after content change, um, I don't know if you guys were in the talk earlier, but they explained very well how the attribute adds the ability to listen to change events on any attribute that's in your in your mod, uh, module module at all. So we do after because any of your attribute change events are preventable. So if you did on and someone prevented it, maybe you would change the value of the tooltip without actually changing the value within the widget itself. So we do after because if it's not prevented, it will fire the event, and then we'll catch it on the after side. And then we're going to update the after content change just by setting the value of the content box to the new value. Um, if you wanted to get the old value to test against it, it looks like that. If, that if, if you need to get that information at all. Everything else is exactly the same. We set the content to content, which whenever it first renders, there is no content in it. In our, in our case, if we wanted content to be inside of it, you would pass it to as the configuration. That way, and the initializer will read in the configuration object and pass it into the initializer and it will set all the values to the ATTRs that way. 
So that's why we also we need to make sure we do it on render. It doesn't really the implementation that we have right now doesn't utilize this in the render, but there may be an author that uses it that would need that. And that's really all I have.